Let's play a little guessing game. I'm going to name the sites you have on your bucket list. Machu Picchu, the Colosseum, Petra, Taj Mahal. Did I get at least one of them right? I have to confess, I was just taking them off the list of the new seven wonders of the world. It was officially finished in 2007 after a worldwide vote. What happened to the old list? Well, it was put together in the 2nd century BCE. And there is just one site currently still standing, the Pyramids of Giza. Pack your bags. We're going to Peru, the home of the mighty Machu Picchu. When it was first discovered in 1911, its explorer thought he had managed to find the lost city of the Inca. Several decades later, it turned out it wasn't the same city. Plus, there were still three farmer families living there, so it couldn't be really called lost and forgotten. No wonder they like it so much there. The stones making up the buildings are cut so precisely and sit together so tightly that you can't even insert a credit card between them. It has saved the city from some serious earthquakes, which are common here. The buildings just dance through all the shaking and then go back into place. And because of the way it's arranged, you can see the sun rise or set exactly behind the important peaks on important days for the Inca. More than half, 60% of all the construction in Machu Picchu was done underground, so you can't even see it. The best part is that there are still things to be discovered if you want to get your name inked in history. Our next stop is on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The mighty Chichen Itza sits here for well over 1,500 years. The structure has exactly 365 steps. You can count when you go next time if you don't trust me. The Maya, who built the whole thing, were really into astronomy. So it's not surprising they made as many steps as there are days in a year. Also, if you happen to be here during the spring or fall equinox, you'll notice the shadows the setting sun casts make it look like there's a snake going down the stairs. The Feathered Serpent was one of the main deities in ancient Mexico. Chichen Itza used to be a busy urban center. It had its ups and downs. And by the time the Spanish arrived, the 16th century, it had been mostly abandoned. The first photos we have from the spot are from the end of the 19th century. Looks like the terraced pyramid had a lot more vegetation on it back in 1892. The only source of fresh water in this dry climate is the cenotes, or water-filled sinkholes. There are four visible cenotes, and the temple pyramid most likely stands on top of one more. Archaeologists are looking for tunnels to enter it. To see our next wonder, you must be prepared to share it with around 15,000 others. That's how many people visit the statue of Christ the Redeemer every day. The statue sits above the Corcovado mountain and weighs roughly 635 tons. Must have been tricky to lift it all the way up there. Actually, it came in parts. A French sculptor, Paul Landowski, made several pieces of the future sculpture out of clay. The head and the hands were made in full size, and the body would be made larger on the spot. The parts of the statue were cut into cubes, and then cast into concrete, and put together. Workers prepared the cement right on the spot, and transferred all the tools by a small cogwheel railroad which tourists used to get up the hill. The statue is the best proof that lightning does strike in the same place more than once. It must be because of its position on top of the mountain, its fingers, head, and eyebrows got damaged by storms. Time to move on. This time, we're going to Agra, India. Yep, to see the Taj Mahal, that beautiful pink construction. Wait, wasn't it always white? Well, the Taj Mahal changes its color depending on what time it is. It looks pale pink or pearly gray at sunrise, crystal white at noon, and the sunset paints it orange bronze. In the evening, it may even seem translucent blue. And that's not the only optical illusion here. When you move towards the main gate, the building seems gigantic. But the closer you get to it, the smaller it looks. The minarets, or towers, on both sides might seem to be standing perfectly straight, but in reality, they're leaning outward. It's done for aesthetic balance, and also to prevent the towers from falling on the main building in case of an earthquake. For construction finished in the 17th century, the Taj Mahal looks good as new. That's because it regularly gets a spa day, 
they apply a proper facial mud pack to it, which is a traditional recipe to keep the radiance. I'm feeling peckish from all the traveling. How about we go to Italy and have some pasta? Just kidding. The real reason would be to see the Colosseum, of course. Its original name was the Flavian Amphitheater because it was built by the Flavian Dynasty. The new name is most likely after the colossal bronze statue of Emperor Nero that was once next to the building. The model for the statue was the Colossus of Rhodes. In its nearly 2,000 years, the Colosseum has lived through at least three major fires and four earthquakes. It was damaged, repaired, and rebuilt many times. The impressive construction once hosted up to 80,000 spectators. What they watched wasn't necessarily as cruel as Hollywood made us believe. Most gladiator matches went under strict rules. Sometimes the public would get bored with the show, and the participants would draw out of the arena. Once the Colosseum stopped serving as an arena for those scary shows, it was used as a cemetery, a place of worship, for housing, workshops for artisans and merchants, the home of a religious order, and a fortified castle. Now it's open to the public, and you can check out its underground labyrinth. Are you ready for the next wonder? It's the lost city of Petra, or rather, the rediscovered city, which was once super rich and vibrant, then got abandoned and found again in 1812. The whole city is made of sandstone, and even though it's in the desert, it has seen some pretty heavy rains. Still, it has lasted 2,000 years thanks to some very skilled workers. Modern laser scanning showed that they put giant steps into the mountain to check the quality of the rock and carve out the buildings without risking their lives. And how did people survive here in the desert without any water? The Nabataeans who lived here developed a whole complicated system of conduits, dams, and cisterns to make sure they have enough vital fluid for the whole year. In case you are in your Indiana Jones mode, there's still a lot to discover here in Petra. Archaeologists believe we only know 15% of the city by now, and the rest is still hidden underground. Let's finish our tour with the largest human-made project in the world. Yep, I'm talking about the Great Wall of China. It stretches for over 13,000 miles from the Bohai Sea in the east all the way to the Gobi Desert in the west. But don't trust the popular myth. You won't really see the wall from the moon. It took over 2,000 years to finish, and a good amount of building materials, mostly bricks and cut stone blocks. Have you ever scratched your name on a tree or even worse, some famous place? No worries, I won't tell anyone. People who built the wall did the same. Some of the bricks, which are mostly from the Ming Dynasty, have some data like production location, brick household name, and the responsible officials. This was a form of quality control. If something happened to any of the bricks, it would be easy to find out who to blame for it. The majority of us have believed for a really long time that Stonehenge, one of the most iconic monuments in the world, was an ancient calendar because of its alignment with the summer and winter solstices. But no one could figure out how it really worked. Now, a team of researchers have come out with another study. It turns out that Stonehenge could have functioned like the solar calendar. It's a similar principle to the solar calendar ancient Egyptians used to have, the one based on a year composed of 365.25 days. Each of the stones from this big mysterious sarsen circle represented one day within a month. Sarsens are what we call these large boulders. It's actually a perpetual calendar, where people could track every winter solstice sunset. That way, those who live near Stonehenge, which is today Wiltshire, UK, could keep track of the days and months of the year. We all now understand this mysterious calendar system because of this interesting discovery in 2020. The team has identified the source of 50 of the 52 sarsens that make up the iconic stone circle we all know about. They analyzed the chemical composition of these sarsens and traced their origins to the West Woods in Wiltshire, which is about 15 miles away from the monument. Not only did these 50 sarsens come from the same source, but they were also placed in their current position at approximately the same time. They make the outer circle of Stonehenge, together with a horseshoe-shaped inner ring. 
Near the center of the monument, there are smaller rocks known as bluestones. The team traced the origins of the bluestones all the way to Wales. They also discovered that the sarsens share a common chemistry, over 99% silica with trace elements. Two sarsens were different from each other and also different from the main cluster. These sarsens were arranged in three different formations at Stonehenge. 30 of them formed this huge stone circle that dominates the monument. Four station stones ended up in a rectangular formation outside the circle, while the rest, located inside the stone circle, were constructed into five trilithons. A trilithon is when you have two vertical stones with a horizontal lintel at the top. 30, 5, and 4 are pretty interesting numbers in the context of this calendar system. The 30 uprights that are spread around the main sarsen ring could represent days of the month. If you multiply that by 12, you get 360. Add on 5 more, those from the central trilithons, and the result is 365. And to really adjust the calendar to match a solar year, you need to add one extra leap day for every four years, right? The team believes the ancient people used the four station stones to keep track of this part. So, in this system, they paired the summer and winter solstice every year with the same pair of stones. Ancient people started building Stonehenge about 5,000 years ago, and it took more than 1,000 years to finish the work. But the Stonehenge you see today is not the complete, original version from the beginning. People have broken and taken away many of its old bluestones and sarsens. The entire structure also changed over time since there were generations and generations, 180 of them to be precise, that passed since the beginning of Stonehenge, who would participate in the building and rebuilding of it. People created Stonehenge in four stages. They first built a circular enclosure that stretched over 330 feet 100 meters, in diameter and went around 56 pits. A high bank flanks the ditch of the enclosure, while there's a low bank on the outside. Some theories even say that this part was some form of a communal cemetery. Later, in the second stage, builders added a horseshoe of sarsen trilithons. In the third stage, they constructed a ceremonial avenue that was nearly two miles long. It possibly traced the path of the blue stones. People moved from the Aubrey holes to the Q and R holes, a double arc that these blue stones have been arranged into. At this stage, builders also reorganized the entrance stones and recut the main enclosure ditch. During the fourth stage, the stones were broken and builders etched carvings into the sarsens. Later, the blue stones ended up being modified again. Builders didn't leave any written records about how they managed to drag these heavy stones to the site and get them to stand so perfectly upright. But there are theories that say their techniques were more closely associated with woodwork than masonry. They made mortise holes and protruding tenons because they wanted to slot these stones together and they used tongue and groove joints to do that. When they dug the hole for the stones, they placed timber poles at the back of the holes that were used as brace support. Then, they moved the stone into a position and hauled it upward with ropes. They packed rubble into the hole to make sure the stone stayed in place. A pre-industrial farming society put this fascinating monument together using only tools made of stone and bone. Not even the wheel had been invented yet. This unusual formation is also known as ringing rocks. The stones you can see at Stonehenge have some pretty odd acoustic properties. When you strike them, they produce a loud clanging sound. That could be one of the reasons why people bothered to transport them over such a long distance in the first place. In some ancient cultures, people believed that these rocks contained healing powers. It's a really popular location that attracts over a million visitors a year. When it first opened to the public, visitors were allowed to walk among the stones. They could even climb on them, as there weren't any restrictions. Until the 19th century, visitors would regularly chip off pieces of the rock to take them home as souvenirs. They would also engrave their initials into the stones. They camped within the circle and dug fire pits, not realizing that the digging pits could seriously undermine the stability of the entire monument. Over time, visitors have encountered more and more restrictions until the monument was finally roped off in 1997 because of the serious erosion of the stones. That means if you want to visit, 
you can only view it from a distance unless you want to pay extra for the Stone Circle experience, which can be arranged outside of normal visiting hours. Stonehenge originally had two entrances that led into the enclosure. There was a wide one to the northeast and one that was a bit smaller and located on the southern side. If you look at it today, you can see there are many more gaps. This is mostly because of tracks made later that once crossed the monument. The ground within Stonehenge has been severely disturbed, and it wasn't just about random visitors digging fire pits. There was a group of people who dug a large deep hole within the stone circle in the 17th century because they were looking for treasure. Then there was Charles Darwin, who also did some digging because he was studying earthworms in the area. He wanted to know how these worms could impact objects in the soil over time. He observed how a fallen stone there had sunk deeper into the ground and realized it was happening because of the activities of these tiny creatures who churned through the soil all the time. In 1963, there was a theory that Stonehenge had been built as some sort of computer that predicts solar and lunar eclipses. Later, some proposed it was actually constructed as a monument to ancestors that had passed away. This theory says the permanence of its stones represented the eternal afterlife. The average sarsen you can find there weighs 25 tons, while the biggest one weighs around 30 tons. If you want to get an idea of how massive these stones really are, you can go behind the visitor center in the outdoor gallery to check out a replica sarsen stone. It's a true copy of a freestanding upright from one of the trilithons that are located in the inner horseshoe of the monument. There are five Neolithic houses at Stonehenge based on real archaeological evidence of houses found in that area. Each of them had stake-built walls and a chalk floor. Some even had furniture. There was also a lot of trash discovered, which means people in this area used to like celebrations and feasting. Research has shown that people lived in these houses for 50 to 100 years, around 4,500 years BCE which was the time when the builders brought the sarsen stones to Stonehenge. During the time they were building Stonehenge, generations of people went through major changes themselves, from the Stone Age to the early Bronze Age. They were no longer as static and isolated. They started to travel and trade more, which means they communicated way more than their ancestors, even internationally. This is how they could have spread the word about Stonehenge, and it's also when the whole mystery and fascination with the monument began. Tourists visit them daily, scrambling for the perfect selfie with some of the world's best-known attractions. But I'm sure you're unaware of these little secrets some of these places are hiding. I promise that today, you will look at these world-famous monuments in a new way. Did you know that the Statue of Liberty has a second name? The Liberty Enlightening the World. And what's hidden in a box under the statue, right here? This massive structure stands watch over the entrance to New York Harbor, welcoming travelers from around the world. And there's a lot about this beautiful lady that may surprise you. Designed by sculptor Frédéric Bartholdi, France gifted it to the United States in 1884. That's a pretty nice present, but there was a catch. Already built and much too big to move, it was dismantled entirely, packed into 200 crates, and shipped across the ocean. Then, workers put it back together in New York like a giant 3D puzzle. And though many assume the statue is made of stone, it is not. The outside is actually thin sheets of metal. Originally, Bartholdi wanted these sheets to be made of pure gold, creating a truly impressive sight. But at 305 feet tall, the expense was too great. He opted for copper, a cheaper material instead. The one drawback, copper turns green over time. When the metal comes in contact with oxygen, it results in a chemical reaction called oxidation. The Statue of Liberty was originally the color of a shiny new penny. Not as impressive as gold, but pretty spectacular. For 25 years, it changed to a darker brown. Then slowly faded to the light green it is today. Because the statue is hollow, you can actually go inside and walk up to her head. I hope you've been working out though, you have to climb 354 stairs to make it to the crown. Though initially open to visitors, the torch is now out of bounds. It was damaged in 1916 and has remained closed ever since. 
Maybe avoid visiting when the weather is bad. In heavy winds, the Statue of Liberty sways up to three inches, while the torch can move as much as five inches. I would turn as green as the statue itself. Oh, and it's hit by nearly 600 bolts of lightning every year. Shocking, I know. There's also a secret box tucked away beneath the statue. It contains a copy of the U.S. Constitution, 20 bronze medals, and a portrait of the statue's designer. Another well-known monument takes us over the Atlantic Ocean to Paris, France. It's the Eiffel Tower. And though appreciated now, did you know it was once so disliked it almost never got built? Or that the engineer added a special floor just for himself when the tower went up? Engineer Gustav Eiffel built it for the 1889 World's Fair. At 1,083 feet tall, it's the same height as an 81-story building. Once finished, it was the tallest human-made structure in the world and remained the tallest for 41 years until the construction of the Chrysler Building in New York City. Before being built, the public received a sneak peek of the designs. People were not impressed. They called it everything from a truly tragic street lamp to a belfry skeleton. And residents, along with the Champ de Mars where the tower was going to be built, actually went to court to block its construction. But authorities sided with Eiffel, and the tower was finally built. Gustav asked the designer of the tower, Maurice Kochlin, to include an apartment at the very top for his private use. It offered a 360-degree view of Paris and had a living room, big enough for a table, a couch, and a piano, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a bedroom. Talk about a luxury penthouse in the sky. Let's take a quick hop over to London next to check out the Big Ben. But which part of the structure does the name actually refer to? You might be surprised. Big Ben is actually the name of the bell, not the tower. That's right. You're more likely to hear Big Ben than see it. It's located in the Clock Tower, which was renamed Elizabeth Tower in 2012. And the only visitors allowed to enter Elizabeth Tower and see Big Ben are residents of the United Kingdom. Everyone else can only admire it from afar. Pity. The bell weighs 16 tons, the same as four and a half hippos, and is seven feet tall. Not far from here is the impressive London Eye, Europe's biggest wheel at 443 feet tall. Less than 30 years old, it still has its secrets. In this case, they involve the number 13, a little romance and tortoises. There are 32 climate-controlled observation capsules on the giant wheel, but they numbered them from 1 to 33. What? The reason is simple. Designers skipped the number 13 because of its association with bad luck. Next time you take an elevator, you'll notice there's no 13th floor in most buildings for the same superstitious reason. The 32 capsules represent the 32 boroughs, or areas of London and it is a top-rated tourist destination, receiving more visitors than the Taj Mahal or Stonehenge. And who knew a giant wheel could be romantic? At least 5,000 marriage proposals and over 500 weddings have taken place here. Not a fan of scary rides? You got nothing to worry about. The London Eye moves at a very slow 10 inches per second, which is twice as fast as a tortoise moving at top speed. The ride doesn't even stop to let people on and off. Back to the United States for this next famous monument, the Hollywood sign. Did you know that it used to be bigger? Or the reason it was built in the first place? Don't worry, I'm about to share all its secrets. Developers S.H. Woodruff and Tracy E. Schultz built the original sign in 1923, creating it to advertise real estate. The two men wanted to establish a new neighborhood called Hollywoodland, and the now iconic sign was simply meant to be a giant advertisement to draw home buyers to the area. They planned to remove it after 18 months. In fact, the original sign spelled out Hollywoodland. The city dropped the last four letters in 1949. And now you can only appreciate it from a distance. Tourists are not allowed anywhere near the actual sign. Standing in your way, razor wire, motion sensors, infrared technology, and alarms. There are even helicopter patrols. Yikes! 
Let's head north to Canada next, to the city of Toronto. When you search along its skyline, you'll see its most famous landmark, the impressive CN Tower. At 1,815 feet tall, it's pretty hard to miss. But what treasure does it hide in a special time capsule tucked away in its walls? It took a whole year for 1,500 workers to build a tower, completed construction in 1974. Two years later, it was open to the public. Afraid of heights? It might not be a tourist attraction for you. First, the elevators have glass sides and a glass floor as well. It takes 58 seconds, speeding at 15 miles per hour to take you from the ground floor to the observation deck in the sky. And the deck also has glass panels on the floor. Don't worry though, you're not going to fall through. They're so strong that they can handle the weight of 35 moose. Hmm, I wonder how they tested that. When the tower opened in 1976, a time capsule was hidden in the wall of the lookout level. Inside, you'll find newspapers, Canadian coins, letters from children, and a letter from Pierre Trudeau. The capsule will remain there until 2076. And there's more! Mount Rushmore actually has a hidden room behind Abraham Lincoln's head, but what's inside? Sculptor Gutzon Borglum initially had a much bolder design in mind, including moments in American history with the four heads of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Lincoln. But his ideas were too ambitious. Instead, he was given permission to create a Hall of Records, a secret chamber that would highlight the history of the United States and any important documents. And finally, what's the secret color-changing magic of the Taj Mahal in India? And the reason is surprisingly simple. The large building can be found in the city of Agra in the northern part of the country. It was built by Shah Jahan as a monument and a tomb for his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Construction started in 1632 and wasn't completed until 1647. White marble covers the outside of the building and is decorated in jewels like lapis lazuli, jade, turquoise, and amethyst. These are placed to create geometric and floral patterns. But if you look at photos of the building, it doesn't always look the same. The color changes depending on the time of day. It has a lot to do with how the sun reflects off the marble. It may seem pinker at dawn, pure white at noon, and an orange bronze at sunset. Some evenings, it may even look translucent blue. A second building was planned, designed by the Shah himself. It was a dark reflection of the original. Instead of white, the plan called for black marble. They never completed it. It's incredible how even more impressive these already cool monuments seem when you know a few of their secrets. It's raining cats and dogs, literally. Things falling down from the sky can be pretty unexpected. So, here are some examples. Residents of Texarkana, Texas, once had light rain and fish shower. No need to go fishing out in the sea. The fish literally falls down on your head. In fact, animal rains are not uncommon. Water spouts or updrafts occurring in different corners of the earth sometimes carry small creatures up with them. Those could be crabs, frogs, or indeed, fish. A water spout is generally a whirlwind that picks up water and grows in size until it connects the surface of the water and the clouds. Lightweight critters living close to the water surface often get caught in the vortex and carried up and away. Thunderstorm clouds are constant companions of water spouts too. When the storm reaches a landmass, it starts slowing down, having nowhere to take the new energy from. It slowly subsides, the atmospheric pressure drops, and the thunderclouds release the water in them, along with the unfortunate small animals and fish. Sometimes it's just a few frogs frozen from the cold up above, but at other times it could be hundreds or thousands of creatures raining down upon the land. A much more unusual rain once happened in Oakville, Washington, and it's still waiting for someone to explain it. The rain clouds looked perfectly normal, but the rain they released was anything but. Translucent jelly-like blobs fell on the town, covering a total area of about 20 square miles. Each of them wasn't larger than a grain of rice. Researchers who studied these raindrops 
claimed that the gooey blobs contained human white blood cells. Some believe they might have been evaporated jellyfish, resulting in rain, or waste from a commercial airplane. Now this kind of rain is what I'd like to see someday, a money shower. One such event occurred in a small town in Germany. A woman was driving when she suddenly saw banknotes swirling down from the sky, so she hit the brakes. She went out of her car and later said she managed to collect quite a large amount of money. After which, as any responsible citizen should, she turned it over to the police. Strangely, when the officers came back to the scene with the woman, they couldn't find any more cash, although she claimed she hadn't been able to collect everything. There's still no explanation for the event, but certainly, no water spout could have caused that. A pretty unpleasant kind of rain happened back in 1876 in Olympia Springs, Kentucky. It was a very local kind, too. Mrs. Crouch said that she had been making soap outside her home when pieces of raw meat suddenly started falling down from the sky around her. Some of those chunks were pretty massive, reaching over three inches in diameter. Local newspapers reported that two people who decided to remain unknown tasted the meat and concluded it was mutton or venison. Months later, scientists decided to find out the truth behind the strange event. It became a matter of heated debate until one of the researchers came up with the most reasonable conclusion. The meat rain must have been caused by vultures flying over the town at the time. These birds sometimes regurgitate food right in the middle of their flight as a defense mechanism or to make their bodies lighter to fly faster. And that must have been what happened right over Mrs. Crouch's house, unfortunately. Something totally inedible, but no less sinister, rained down on several villages in India in the middle of May of 2022. Huge black and silver metal balls started dropping from the sky, the first one weighing over 15 pounds. Astounded residents watched in shock as it hammered the ground, scattering pieces of itself across the nearby fields. Similar balls later fell in the other two neighboring villages. Luckily, no one was harmed during the strange metal rain. But the issue remained. We're on Earth, and it usually rains water here. The local authorities weren't sure what it was about, but astronomers soon voiced a theory that it could be debris from a space rocket. One that fits the description had launched in September of 2021, aiming to put a communication satellite into orbit. Upon its re-entry into the atmosphere, it might have been damaged, causing several chunks of it to detach and fall down on the ground in India. Sometimes it rains birds, too. One such event occurred in Arkansas in 2010. Weather conditions might cause things like that to happen, but there are simpler reasons, too. Loud noise and confusion, or even collisions with aircraft. In the case of Arkansas, it was the noise and flashing lights from the New Year's Eve fireworks. The show startled thousands of birds and made them start into the air. They were panicking and disoriented, so they collided with buildings, cars, and trees. Many of them eventually fell to the ground, making lots of people believe it was actually raining birds. Now, if anything could startle me out in the sky, it's a rain of spiders. And if you wonder whether it's a real thing, well, yes, it is. In Australia, spider rains actually happen quite often. They even have a name for this, ballooning. It goes like this. Spiders that can balloon climb up trees and tall bushes, trying to reach the highest point available in the area. When they've climbed up to the very top, they spin their web in such a way that it allows them to be carried by the wind. And there it goes, clutching the strands of the web with its tiny little feet. The brave spider lifts off into the air and flies to whatever awaits it out there. Normally, ballooning goes unnoticed by us humans because spiders don't travel in large groups. You might have a shocking experience when a spider suddenly lands on your face out of nowhere, but otherwise, it's a rare occasion to meet more than two ballooners at once. Still, when the weather gets particularly bad, with lots of rain or wind, thousands or even millions of spiders might decide it's time to move to somewhere friendlier and take to the sky all at once. That's when spider rains occur. Those who witnessed the most recent ones back in 2012 and 2015 say it looks like a snowfall. Spiders slowly drifting down on their web parachutes that settle on the ground and turn it white. 
Remember water spouts? Well, those things can lift not only fish and frogs into the sky and make a spectacular show of them falling back on the ground. Golf balls sometimes become their cargo too. And I'm not speaking of golf ball sized hail, but actual balls. The town of Punta Gorda in Florida witnessed a rain of golf balls in 1969. Newspapers reported dozens upon dozens of those things pummeling the ground and buildings for a short while. Since it's a coastal town with lots of golf courses, it wasn't hard to explain the event. A water spout must have formed near the shore, traveled to some course, grabbed a few dozen golf balls, and then released them over the town. Rain can be pretty refreshing, as long as it's not mud rain. On April 12, 1902, the town of Easton, Philadelphia experienced an unusual shower. It made all those unfortunate enough to go outside take an actual shower and wash their clothes to boot. The raindrops looked dirty to the eye, and they were. People, buildings, and streets looked really wanting to take a good bath after it stopped pouring. The witnesses reported a considerable amount of dust in the air before the rain started, which probably explains the event. In 2011, a town in Scotland saw another weird rain variety. It was showered with worms. The rain didn't cover a large area. It seems only some local academy students were unlucky enough to get invertebrates falling on their heads while playing soccer. There was a significant change in the weather at the time, so scientists believe it might have resulted from some meteorological anomaly. It was April 10, 1912. Richard had just departed from Southampton, England, aboard the most famous ship of the time, dubbed the Unsinkable. Since he had just witnessed a near collision with the SS City of New York, he decided to write to his wife and report the unfortunate and frightening event. My dearest Sal, he wrote, we got away yesterday after a lot of trouble. Little did he know that a mere four days later, both his pen and the ship he was on would be lost forever at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. Was this some sort of bad omen? Did Richard actually foresee what was about to happen to the ship he was on? In case you haven't figured it out by now, Mr. Richard Geddes was aboard the Titanic on the day that he wrote the letter to his wife. On April 14, 1912, the ship seemed to have been lost forever. Along with it, so many secrets and treasures have settled at the bottom of the ocean. It took until 1985 for the Titanic's wreck to be finally rediscovered using state-of-the-art sonar technology. Ever since then, they've managed to recover thousands of items from the Titanic, and many of them went on display or auction. Things like jewelry, a life jacket, a menu from the ship's restaurant, or even a sample square of carpet from the first-class stateroom have all captivated the public's attention, just like the many stories of the people on board. Scientists have even tried to come up with strategies to get the Titanic back up altogether to properly study it and stop it from getting more and more damaged at the bottom of the ocean. Some have suggested filling the wreck with ping pong balls to make it float, while others even considered injecting it with 180,000 tons of Vaseline. Another idea was to use 450,000 tons of liquid nitrogen to trap it in an iceberg that would float to the surface. But they eventually had to let go of all these potential strategies, since the Titanic is way too fragile to ever be recovered. The Titanic may be one of the most interesting ships lying at the bottom of the ocean, at least in popular culture, but deep sea divers have a lot of other stories to share. Planes also sometimes find their way to the bottom of the ocean. Deep sea divers in Oahu, Hawaii came across the wreckage of an F4U Corsair plane. It seems to have crashed into the ocean in 1946, as it didn't have sufficient fuel. If you can dive deep enough, you might even stumble upon statues and lost artifacts, like those found in the world's only underwater archaeological park off the coast of Naples, Italy. It features the ruins of the ancient Roman city of Baia. The underwater statues found here are breathtaking, to say the least. In an ironic twist of events, some of the equipment we intended to use to get us to the moon was lost at the bottom of the sea for a very long time. But how did that happen? Beginning from the late 1960s and ending in the early 70s, many Apollo rockets were launched to orbit the Earth and the Moon. 
When reaching altitudes of about 38 miles, the first portion of the spacecraft, including the engines, needed to separate. People thought these components got destroyed or lost forever. But were they really? In 2012, a team of specialists discovered a bunch of rocket engines 14,000 feet off the coast of Florida. They have since gone through a two-year renovation plan and are now on display at Seattle's Museum of Flight. Can you imagine stumbling upon a whole city underwater? Back in 2001, a lost city was discovered in the Gulf of Cambay off the coast of India. Some archaeologists believe it to be the oldest city in history. By comparison, it's almost the size of Manhattan and features massive walls and even plazas. They stumbled upon pieces of sculpture, artwork, and even what looked like ancient wooden furniture, believed to date back up to 9,500 years ago and 5,000 years older than any city previously discovered. Okay, how about an underwater river? I can't even imagine what that would look like, but some deep divers claim to have seen it south of Tula, Mexico. Is that even possible? Well, not really, since the Cenote Angelita Cave is not a true river, but a very special type of optical illusion. It's formed by a halocline, meaning a cloud of hydrogen sulfide at the bottom of this underwater cave. Turns out you can actually swim right through this cloud, which makes you feel like you're swimming through a flowing body of water. Not all things discovered underwater are inanimate objects. Some of them are actually quite scary sea creatures. A jellyfish might not be on your list of things to look out for if you can avoid the stings. But this giant one, also known as a lion's mane jellyfish, is the largest known species of its kind. In all fairness, you'll only uncover it if you happen to dive into the waters of the Arctic, Northern Atlantic, and Northern Pacific Oceans. You surely won't miss it, since it stretches across 120 feet from the top to the bottom of its tentacles. When it comes to deep sea diving, a lot of people are looking to discover some lost treasure. One diver was lucky enough to have hit the literal jackpot when he came upon nearly $1 million worth of treasure on the bottom of the seabed. That was back in 2015, when this lucky diver was swimming just off the coast of Florida. What did he find, you might ask? Well, about 51 gold coins, 40 feet of gold chain, and a rare single coin that was tailored for the King of Spain, Philip V. Speaking of people looking for lost treasures, divers also sometimes found pirate ships. They discovered one of these pirate shipwrecks in 2015 off the coast of Colombia. It dates back to the 18th century. The value of this forgotten ship was estimated to be between $4 billion and $17 billion, as it contained treasures, precious stones, gold, and countless other really valuable items. By comparison, a whole island in the Bahamas is up for grabs at $75 million. A computer is the last thing you'd ever expect to discover underwater, right? And this was no regular computer, but an ancient one. And yet, Someone stumbled upon it between 1900 and 1901 on the spot of a shipwreck located off one Greek island. Researchers believe this weird stone contraption to be the earliest form of a computer. It was designed to serve many purposes, such as predicting astronomical positions and eclipses on the calendar. Since humanity lost most of the technology used back then, it was wonderful to rediscover it so many years later. It let us piece together many of the ancient Greeks' accomplishments. The computer is now at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens, should you ever want to check it out in person. This has to be one of the most mysterious places on Earth. It's called the Mariana Trench, and it's the deepest part of the Earth's oceans. We really don't know how deep it is, since it's so difficult to measure. But it's somewhere around 7 miles deep, and 5 times longer than the Grand Canyon. They first studied this massive underwater hole back in 1875 using a weighted rope. Back in 2012, a Canadian film director named James Cameron reached the bottom of the trench in the submersible vessel Deep Sea Challenger. Some of the most bizarre creatures on the planet call this place their home, including the Dumbo octopus, the sea cucumber, and the goblin shark. The Mariana Trench took its name after the nearby Mariana Islands, which are named Las Marianas in honor of the Spanish queen, Mariana of Austria. 
A strange lake appeared in India 52,000 years ago. It was formed here literally out of nowhere. I recall it was a Wednesday. Anyway, for tens of thousands of years, people came up with various scary stories about the lake. Some locals believe this place was cursed. Others think that the lake's bottom hides the gateway to the underworld. But those are all legends. The real reason for the appearance of this Lonar Lake is even more surprising. At first, scientists were sure that the lake was an ancient crater of a long-extinct volcano. It's in a balsam field made of 65-million-year-old volcanic rock. But then, geologists conducted a detailed analysis of the soil and water, and found that Lonar Lake had a space origin. Geologists found a unique glass inside the lake that forms only with a strong impact and energy release. 52,000 years ago, a huge meteorite weighing 2 million tons fell into this place. It was almost six times heavier than the Empire State Building. The striking power was so high that the volcanic rock melted and turned into glass. Perhaps the bottom of this lake still contains particles of this giant meteorite that flew to us from the distant space depths. Okay, we have a lake created by a space object more than 50,000 years ago. But even this is not the strangest thing about it. In 2020, the locals noticed that Lonar Lake had turned pink. In just a few days, the salt water mysteriously changed its color. Biologists and geologists immediately took water samples to the Scientific Research Center. The detailed analysis showed that the water contained an increased level of unique microbes. They accumulate on the surface and emit some pink pigment. Soon, these microbes settled to the bottom, and the lake became transparent again. Also, rains help the water go back to its usual appearance. These microbes color the lake and make the pink plumage of flamingos even brighter. The birds get food from the Lonar Lake and absorb these pink bacteria. Now, Lonar Lake is a popular place among tourists. But this is not the only thing that may surprise you in India. Our next stop is a small village with about 2,600 people located in a hot rainforest. The locals are very hospitable. They welcome not only tourists, but also one of the most venomous reptiles on the planet. King cobras are crawling in almost every house in this village. Locals are happy to see them as if they were their pets. People share water and food with these animals. They even give the reptiles a special corner where they can relax from the scorching sun. Ah, Cobras crawl in houses, schools, and even on the streets. Humans and reptiles are used to each other and feel safe. There has never been a case of a cobra attack in the village. It's the only place in the world where these venomous reptiles live in such harmony with people. Now, imagine a town that consists of many little united villages. The residents are all engaged in agriculture. They know how to extract water from ground rocks, and they bargain well. The town has been thriving for several centuries, and people live happily in it. Then, one day, everything changes. All the residents quickly pack up their stuff and run away from their homes. Overnight, the town becomes abandoned. It is a real story that happened in the state of Rajasthan in 1825. And still, no one knows why the people disappeared from there. The most popular version says that the cruel local ruler collected large taxes from the locals. Then he fell in love with the daughter of the chief of this town and threatened that he would collect extra taxes if the girl refused to be his wife. Citizens decided to support the woman and her father and left their homes in one day. This town is still empty, but the locals from the nearest cities are afraid to approach. Our next stop is the state of Maharashtra. There's a small village there with very positive people. They go to stores, cafes, schools, and banks. Everything here seems quite ordinary, and you wouldn't notice what's so special about this place. But just wait for the night to come. People go to sleep and no one locks their houses. There are no locks at all in this village. The door of any building is always open here. The owners leave the shops, cafes, and libraries open. When locals go to work, they don't lock up their homes either. They don't hide money and jewelry. The reason for this is the complete absence of thefts. The villagers are sure that anyone can get into serious trouble for stealing. According to a legend, about 300 years ago, 
After prolonged rains and floods, a large black stone slab appeared in the center of the village. This slab symbolized an Indian mythical creature that watched over the locals. At some point, people stopped locking their houses because they knew that no one would dare to commit theft in that creature's face. In 2015, a police station was opened here, but almost no one has reported an incident since then. The building doesn't even have doors because the police don't keep anyone there. Another fantastic place in India is a village in the state of Assam. Hundreds of locals prepare here for an unusual celebration every now and then. They arrange a magnificent wedding ceremony. They set the table, dress up in beautiful costumes, and bring gifts. And all this for the newlyweds. But instead of people, frogs get married here. Locals hold weddings for wild frogs to summon rain. The incredible thing is that the ceremony looks just like a real wedding. The fun can last all day until late at night. Now, there's one dangerous and inaccessible island in India. You can find it in the Bay of Bengal. It's called the North Sentinel. It's a small piece of land that looks like a tropical paradise. But you won't be able to get there. Since 1956, nobody can travel to this place. The Coast Guard is always sailing around and patrolling the area. The reason for this is the local Sentinelese tribe. This tribe lives isolated from the whole world. They don't know about modern technologies, the internet, or television. For centuries, the Sentinelese have lived on their own, away from civilization. And the people from India want to keep it that way. Anyone who approaches their island is welcomed by the tribe with a flurry of spears and arrows. And it doesn't matter if you're coming by boat or helicopter. Another reason why you can't get on the island is the Sentinelese immune system. The Coast Guard is trying to protect the local tribe from possible diseases and infections that outsiders can bring with them. The locals have no immunity from the flu or even a simple cold. They don't know what that is. Also, there are coral reefs and limestone around the island which significantly complicates the passage of large ships. Despite all the prohibitions, many people tried to get to the island. In 1880, one officer accidentally discovered this island. He went ashore and found a noble soil ideal for growing coconut palms. The officer also noticed several huts on the island, but didn't dare meet the locals. Explorers and travelers presented the islanders with fish as a gift many times. The locals accepted it, asked for more, but still didn't let them approach their houses. It was also challenging to make friends with the tribe because they communicate in one of the most difficult languages to learn in the world. Scientists and linguists have been studying this language for decades. At the end of the 20th century, outsiders made some progress in building a connection with the tribe. In 1991, a team of anthropologists invited the islanders aboard a large ship. They gave bags of coconuts to tribe members. This may be where the phrase, left holding the bag, came from. Or not. Otherwise, let's just leave these folks alone, shall we? It all started with the home insurance building that was built in 1885 in Chicago. Just a 10-story building, but it was a revolution at the time. And that was the beginning of the era of skyscrapers. It was constructed using a revolutionary method. The building had an inner skeleton made of steel, which allowed the walls to be thinner and the whole structure being higher than ever. It stood until 1931, when it was demolished to build the Bank of America that stands even today. That very same year, the construction of the Empire State Building in New York was completed. The Empire State is as tall as 10 home insurance buildings on top of one another. That's the construction progress humanity made in just 46 years. The Empire State became the tallest construction in the world and held that status for 39 years. Now, a bit more than a half century later, the Empire State Building is ranked 53 on the list of the tallest constructions. Humanity has climbed way higher. The tallest building in the world today is Burj Khalifa, located in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. It's 2,717 feet tall, more than two Empire State Buildings on top of one another. Even though skyscrapers started out in the United States, they became tremendously popular in Asia. 
Just to put it in perspective, around 80% of the skyscrapers that exist in the world are in Asia. And in total, the continent has over 7,500 skyscrapers. The country with the most skyscrapers is China, having almost 3,000 of them. Why do they like skyscrapers so much? Well, Asia has the largest population in the world and their economy is booming. So, growing high is a perfect solution to fit as many people as possible in its cities. But close to China, there's also India, having almost the same population. Still, they have 10 times fewer skyscrapers, with their number being a bit over 200, and most of them being located in Mumbai. So why doesn't India build skyscrapers if it's such a great way to accommodate people? Turns out, the country strictly regulates the construction, saying that it's due to health and safety. You see, there's quite a popular urban theory that big structures that accommodate a lot of people lead to higher population density, more anonymity in the city, and lower safety in the territory. So India is trying to avoid it by building low. Problem is that when a city can't accommodate everyone who wants to live there, the cities start growing horizontally. One more thing is that the land and the apartments are very expensive due to their scarcity, so very few people can afford it. This way, India has started to loosen the restrictions recently and is now slowly allowing to build a bit higher. 34 skyscrapers are now under construction. Do you know what other place in the world refuses to build skyscrapers too? Europe. New York alone has more skyscrapers than all of Europe combined. There are just 250 skyscrapers in Europe, and half of them are in just three cities. Europe has a whole different reason to resist tall buildings. The history of skyscrapers goes back to just a bit over 100 years ago, to the 20th century USA. The USA is quite a young country, and the cities are still being built from scratch. There is a lot of available land. When the United States were being built, many European cities had already been around for dozens of centuries. There's not much more room for construction, and no one has any desire to take down the Colosseum and put some fancy skyscraper there instead. There was also no practical reason for changing things. The driving force of Asian and American skyscrapers is the booming population of the cities. Also, Europeans are very protective of their city skylines. The story comes to Brussels, the capital of Belgium, which even got the term Brusselization. In the 1960s, there were no zoning regulations and some buildings in Brussels were demolished to make room for more modern buildings to develop business districts. Uncontrollable construction started, and modern buildings were built in random places around Brussels. They had no cultural or historical value, and they didn't fit in the city architecture at all, messing up the city's image. Many architects and people protested, and new laws were introduced, restricting the demolition of buildings of historical importance and taking construction under control. Other European countries learned from Belgium's mistakes. Populations across Europe still dislike modern structures. Many cities adopted zoning regulations and building a fancy glass skyscraper in Europe isn't that easy. Still, cities with big financial centers like London, Frankfurt or Istanbul require commercial space. So, in some cities, there are several skyscrapers somewhere outside the historic centers, forming separate skyscraper districts. Rome, the capital of Italy and one of the oldest cities in the world, rejected skyscrapers completely, stating that no high-rise will ever appear there. Also, have you noticed that most skyscrapers are made of glass? Turns out, the choice is not random at all, and there are several reasons to favor glass in their construction. The first one is that glass can be pressed in every shape possible, so the skyscraper can no longer be just a plain, boring vertical tower as before. But all of these fancy designs we have around the world now. The second reason is that glass is a very thin material. The walls are thinner and the floors are bigger, providing more inner space, unlike in the pre-home insurance building times. 
Glass is also transparent. Glass reduces the need for electrical lighting inside the building, so it's also very cost-effective. Even more, glass is temperature and therefore weather-resistant. And finally, it just looks posh, fancy, and modern. So, theoretically, skyscrapers maximize urban space, accommodate more people, and reduce energy use. In practice, everything is a bit less efficient. Skyscrapers have more space between them than lower buildings, so that already means more land used than we imagined. Also, around 40% of a skyscraper's floor space isn't... You're driving along a deserted road. There are lifeless fields on the sides and high mountains in front. You stop near a yellow sign. It says, the phenomenon that defies gravity. You go a little further, drive uphill, and stop the car. A strange anomaly occurs right there. You release the gas pedal, turn off the engine, and take your hands off the steering wheel. Your car is moving up. You get out of the vehicle and see it from the side. The road rises, and the car rolls further as if the road goes down. You can put a bowling ball, and it will also move against the laws of physics. This place is called Magnetic Hill. It's located 18 miles from the Indian city of Leh. Every year, thousands of tourists come here to enjoy the picturesque mountain landscape and see the unusual phenomenon with their own eyes. There are many legends around this place. Locals believe this road leads to the sky. It draws good people up, and the bad ones get confused and can't find a way to reach the sky. Scientists have a different possible explanation. This hill has a strong magnetic force coming out deep from the ground. It's so powerful that planes flying over this place encounter interference with their navigational devices. Also, many travelers from all over the world reported GPS and compass failures. There may be a source of magnetic force here, but this theory has never been proven. Magnetic Hill is a powerful optical illusion. You think the road's going up, but it's going down. The shape of the surrounding landscape and the mountain horizon change the perception of the road and create an optical illusion. To see the next natural optical illusion, you need to get on a ship and go far away from the shore. You're in the middle of the sea. The sky and sea are divided by a straight line of water. There are no clouds and the sun goes down. You're watching a beautiful sunset and see a bright green flash. It seems as if the sun has turned green, but the effect disappears after two seconds, and you see the orange-red light again. You can also observe the green flash at sunrise. This natural phenomenon happens when light passes through the atmosphere at a certain angle. The atmosphere bends the shape of the sun's rays and separates them into different colors. Combinations of these colors look like a green flash. There are several varieties of green flash, and the rarest one is green ray. Immediately after the sun sets over the horizon, a green ray of light releases into the sky. You can observe it when the green flash mixes with foggy air. The next illusion is located in the swamps. It's night. You're driving along a highway between two British cities. The moon is shining brightly, and you're driving off the road to a swampy area. Then you get out of the car and look at the dark green waters. There's no one around except croaking frogs. At this moment, strange orange lights appear in the air. It hangs right over the swamp and flies in different directions. It's like somebody's trying to light your way with a kerosene lamp. For centuries, people have observed this phenomenon and called it fool's fire or spook lights. Previously, People thought that somebody who was in trouble lit a torch to call for help. People walked towards the light and got into swamp traps. Today, science can explain the nature of phantom lights. Bioluminescent fungi and algae grow in swampy places and sometimes glow with a blue color. From a distance, this creates an illusion of little lights. The wind and water shake the algae and it seems like the lights are flying. Also. There's a lot of plant material in the swamps. Leaves, grass, mud, clay, tree branches. 
This stuff decomposes quickly in damp conditions and releases methane. When methane contacts the air, it ignites and flies over the swamp in the form of a burning ball. This phenomenon is observed all over the world in swampy areas, but the most famous flying lights are located in the desert of West Texas. It's called Marfa Lights. A lot of people saw lights the size of a basketball flying over the desert. They have yellow, blue, and red shades. The lights flicker, merge, divide into two parts, fly high. You can see them several times a year under different weather conditions. There's no exact scientific explanation for Marfa lights, but one of the theories says it's the headlights of cars passing on a neighboring highway. The heated air and the desolate flat terrain create the effect of flying balloons. It could also happen when cold air gets over warm air and light passes through them. Many people think Marfa lights appear for the same reason as the lights in British swamps. There are huge reserves of oil and natural gas, including methane, in Texas. It comes out of the ground and fires up. You arrive in sunny California and stop the car at the foot of the Santa Lucia Mountains. Here, you feel as if someone's watching you, but there's no people around. You raise your head and look at the mountains. There are silhouettes of huge people on the peaks. They are three to four times larger than an ordinary person and they seem to be wearing raincoats and hats. They just look at you, and you feel their heavy gaze. You sweat and want to run away, but your legs don't listen to you. After a few seconds, the giants disappear. You get in the car and drive out of this place as quickly as possible. This phenomenon is called Dark Watchers. People first noticed it more than 300 years ago, but still, no one can explain its nature. The most common hypothesis says that the clouds create shadows that fall on the rocks. The human brain draws an image of giants from these shadows. This may be a mind deception. For many years, people have been telling each other about the Watchers, so everyone sees what they believe in. Our next stop is Nashville, Indiana. There's a hotel here built in the 19th century. The building is well preserved to this day and still welcomes guests. The name of the hotel is The Story Inn. There are 18 rooms and each of them has a unique history and is made in a different style. The hotel preserves the atmosphere of the 19th century, so you won't find a lot of modern technologies here. You book a room, go up to the desired floor and open the door. The room looks old, but cozy and neat. You put your things down and notice an old book on the table. As soon as you open it, your eyes widen. Each page tells about the paranormal activity that occurs in this hotel. You read in detail about each specific strange case that happened in hotel rooms. Behind each door, you can encounter different creepy things. The book contains dates and a detailed description of each strange case. It looks like a report or an administrator's journal. These books had already been here when the current hotel owner bought this building. The owner decided to keep them to attract tourists, and it worked. Fans of weird things often stay at the Story Inn. The most popular story among guests and employees is the story of the Blue Lady. Many people believe that if you light up a room with blue color, the lady will appear. She has blue eyes and leaves blue objects in the room. Sometimes, it appears just like that, in the light of day or at night. Of course, that's all legends. But you go to the nearest store and buy a transparent plastic cover for the table lamp. You come to the room, turn off the light, and wrap the lamp with the cover. Then, you draw the curtains and click on the switch. You still don't remember exactly what happened that day at the hotel, but you'll never forget those blue eyes. You're standing on the red carpet, waiting for the train to come. The Maharajas Express is India's most expensive and luxurious train ride. It's heavy on the wallet, too. The prices can range from $2,900 to a whopping $23,000. This multi-award winning train has a bunch of extravagant rooms to pick from. It also passes through more than 10 different cities in India. The train finally arrives and you board it. You're accompanied by many friendly staff members that help you with your luggage. They show you in and give you a quick tour of the amenities before leading you to your room. Like every other room, yours has a butler 
to fulfill any of your requests. The Deluxe Cabin has a luxury and cozy interior with international safety features. Among them, there are smoke detectors and security cams. The suspension system underneath the railroad car smooths all the bumps, letting you relax completely. You enter a 112 square foot cabin to take a look. The first thing you see is a king size bed with high end bed sheets. It seems to be inviting you to come and take a nap. You have a closet for all your stuff and a large LCD television with a DVD player. But don't worry, there's Wi Fi as well. There's also a personalized safe to keep your things and documents. Inside the cabin, there's a bathroom with a shower cubicle and hot and cold running water. It's equipped with a hairdryer and even has such toiletries as essential oils. There's probably no need to mention that the bathroom has bath slippers, a bathrobe, and several towels that can always be washed upon request. After going around the cabin, you decide to check the other rooms they offer. The train has 20 of these deluxe cabins, 12 of which have twin beds and eight king-size beds. There are plenty of staff members for all the passengers so that you won't feel underserved. You move on to the junior suite and notice that it's bigger than the deluxe suite. This one is 150 square feet and offers the same luxuries as the previous one. All these suites come with air conditioning and a direct interphone to contact any staff member. After you've taken a look around, the butler escorts you to the suite. He opens the door for you and you immediately feel as if you've set foot in a royal palace. The suite is way bigger than the other two cabins. Its size is 220 square feet and it even has a separate living room. There are four of such rooms on the train, and they all come with king-size beds and large panoramic windows to enjoy amazing views. You go inside for a room tour. The cabin has the same features as the others, but the living room has armchairs with side tables to do some reading or work on your laptop. The suite also has a mini fridge equipped with complimentary tea, coffee, water, and snacks. The bathroom has a bathtub to relax or even take a nap in. You're sold. You're ready to unpack and dip in that bathtub. But that's when the butler tells you there's an even bigger cabin. You stop gawking at the walls and ceiling and follow him to the presidential suite. There's just one such suite on the train. The butler opens the door for you, and wow, this 450 square foot mini palace is the most luxurious train cabin in all of India and one of the best in Asia. It has the same features as the other cabins, but you can't take your eyes off that beautifully decorated ceiling in spacious design that makes you feel like royalty. The presidential suite is named Navaratana. It means nine precious gems. It has two bedrooms, a bathroom and a living room. One bedroom has a king-sized bed and the other has twin beds. The living room is furnished with a sofa where you can read a book or relax and a table for writing. This suite comes with a personal guide and a luxury car that takes you around whenever the train makes a stop. You put your bags down and sign up for the presidential suite. It's the most expensive cabin on the train, $23,000. The train starts moving after everyone has boarded. You inform the butler that you don't want to be disturbed and ask him to remind you for breakfast at 8 a.m. For now, you lie down on your bed and look out the window at the magnificent views of India. It's 8 a.m. and the butler tells you it's time to go to the restaurant. You leave your cabin, and the staff members greet and welcome you. You walk over to one of the restaurants called Mayor Mahal, which means peacock. It's the national bird of India. You're seated by the window and given a menu. You can choose between international and Indian cuisine. The waiters are on standby, ready to offer you their services. By the way, in case an emergency happens, there's always a team of paramedics prepared to act quickly. The Maharajas Express offers four unique journeys to take. The Indian Panorama, the Indian Splendor Journey, the Heritage of India, and the Treasures of India. Altogether, the trips can take you to 12 different destinations. You pick the Indian Panorama, which is a six night and seven day long tour that begins in Delhi and ends in Mumbai. After breakfast, you head back to your presidential suite and switch on a movie while eating some yummy snacks. The train leaves Delhi and arrives in Jaipur several hours later. After a quick briefing and lunch, everyone heads down to the city to do some sightseeing. The guide takes you and a bunch of other people to visit the city palace galleries and later to have dinner at the Rambagh Palace Hotel. 
The next day, you can either opt for another tour or have a spa day at the hotel. You arrive in Ranthambar and have a tour around the national park. You come across tigers and other wild animals. After that, you take other tours, including a trip to deserted city Mughal city of Fatehpur, Sikiri. You head back to the train after a long day and decide to visit the lounge. The Raja Club has comfortable seats with an amazing view of the world outside. You pick a seat, order a drink, and start chatting with other passengers. You even find a fun board game to unleash your competitive side. After a while, some people go back to their cabins. The next day, you wake up in Agra, the city of the Taj Mahal. It's considered to be one of the wonders of the world. Your eyes start gleaming at the sight of it. Everyone gathers around to take pictures with a colossal white marble construction in the background. After that, you can visit more historic sites or have another spa day at the hotel. You pick the second option. It's a one-of-a-kind mm. experience. You're almost all the way through the trip, but not before you arrive at Orca and hop on a tuk-tuk to explore the city. Then it's day six, and you're in Varanasi and go see the Sarnath ruins, followed by a visit to the Silk Weaving Center. It's quite hot, so you take a boat ride on the magical Ganges River. You're impressed by the amazing scenery, and in the evening, you experience an exclusive vegetarian dinner at the Bridge Ram Palace. You head back to the train together with everyone else. This is the last night you'll spend there before going back home the next day. You've made lots of friends and seen some of the most unique places in the world. You take part in a lavish party at the restaurant where all the guests and staff enjoy themselves. You wake up the next day in your presidential suite knowing you'll leave it by 3 p.m. The train is heading back to Delhi. You ask your butler to bring in some breakfast since you feel like treating yourself today. And after packing all your stuff, you head to the restaurant to have some lunch with everyone else. You arrive in Delhi with all your bags packed and ready to roll. The train stops and everyone exits. This magnificent trip has eventually come to its end. And even though it was a very expensive journey, deep inside, you know you'll be back to discover more of India. It's staring at you, and you're staring at it. A giant eye that seems to be pulling you into an abyss. You're hovering over it in your space copter. But however scared you might be, you still need to do your job. So you send your copter down to the surface of the red planet. Right, that's where you are, on Mars. But first things first, you take a moment to remember everything you know about the fourth planet from the Sun. It's the last of the inner planets. Those are the planets that lie within the asteroid belt. They're also called terrestrial, since they're made up of rocks and metals. The atmosphere of Mars is much thinner than Earth's. It contains 95% carbon dioxide and a mere 1% of oxygen. In other words, don't even think about pulling off your helmet. Anyway, there's no time to waste. You land on the surface of the planet and find yourself in a brownish-red world. It's a good thing you're wearing a spacesuit. This place is freezing cold. The thermometer sewn into the sleeve of your suit shows minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Time to take your first step on the Martian surface. The planet looks quite colorful, and the hue of a particular area depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The ground under your feet is covered in fine dust. It looks like rust. The same orange dust is in the air. Good thing you have your own supply of oxygen and don't need to 